Not that horrible in the grand scheme of things, but the guy has passed my threshold at this point, and I need to vent. So, I'm sure anyone that has ever DM'd has experienced this issue. You want the players to roll some dice. So you call for a check for something that should be obvious, with some half-baked DC in mind. And then, everyone fails. Whoops. You feel embarrassed. But hopefully, it's a learning curve, and you try to make this mistake less frequently in future. At the very least, try to avoid checks that are going to stall the game if everyone fails. Not this guy. Want to see if there's writing on a wall? Roll a check. Want a statue actually described to you? Roll a check. Can your character remember how to breathe? Roll a check. By the way, the minimum DC is 10. It's 5th edition D&D, no matter how basic the check. The vast majority of checks convey no information beyond what you would have seen at a glance. No matter how high you roll, it will frequently be 15 or more for actions a child could complete successfully, and the guy just does not seem to be capable of learning. The most recent session featured multiple high DC investigation checks, and when we predictably failed them, we just had to wander around in circles, poking things with ten-foot poles. Meanwhile, I look out of the window at the glorious sunshine and wonder what on earth I'm doing with my life. I find this a particularly funny and familiar problem, as it comes up quite often with new DMs, which, yes, even included me at some point. Skill checks are a test of skill, meaning they, by their very definition as a test, require something to be at stake should it fail. What could possibly go wrong by opening your bathroom door? Overwhelmingly, the answer will be nothing. Unless I'm hiding in your walls. He's in your goddamn wall! So more than likely in that case, you don't need to roll a skill check to open that door. Say instead, that you needed to precariously balance yourself on a beam that is sturdy, but below you is a gelatinous ooze that hungrily waits for you to fall. I would say that takes time, but I wouldn't say you make a roll. But from that position, let's change it up. Say you're crossing that same beam, but now you're carrying a bag full of loot, and you're clad in full plate armor. Yeah, we're making a skill check now. And what's at stake isn't just the risk that your character would fall, but it's also now the potential that you could drop your heaving bag of loot, which is arguably worse. A perfect assessment I've seen on when to roll a skill check is on a Dice Goblin blog by Lars Hubrix, which breaks the process of determining when to roll for a skill check down into a small checklist of three items. Gear, time, and skill. If you have one or none, the test is impossible. If you have two, you roll. But if you have all three, then there's no point in rolling. And it makes sense. If nothing is at risk, you know what to do, and you have all the time in the world to do it, then yeah, you just do it. For an example, if I walk up to your mom and I have the skill Riz, my gear is my new Bugatti, and I show her the time of her life, then with all three, I don't need a skill check to be doing your mom. My name is Jacob Crow, and welcome to the Crow's Perch, where, like an absentee father, I show up once a week in a desperate attempt to connect with you, my viewers, by showing you my favorite stories, these being of tabletop role-playing tragedies. In this next story, a former Vampire the Masquerade storyteller joins in in a new D&D game with a group of friends and an encounter with their new dungeon master escalates from an awkward first impression into mockery, as the player is turned on by both the GM and then later their group, as they slowly become convinced that they had somehow become a that guy. Hmm, what's the NB version of a that guy? That pal? Fight about it in the comments section. So, without further ado, let's gather up a murder and dive into this. Story. It was my first year in college. Like most freshmen, I was both excited and nervous about getting to meet so many new people. I eventually became friends with three girls from my class, Kate, Eve, and Abby. 
when we were talking about our hobbies. They got excited when I told them how I was GMing for a Vampire the Masquerade campaign. They all said they had always wanted to play TTRPGs, especially D&D. I said I would have been delighted to GM for them, but since I, unfortunately, didn't have the time and resources to GM two campaigns, I would still have to wait a bit until my schedule opened up and we could start. By the way, I'm not sure if this is relevant, but I am a non-binary person who dresses mostly femme, so I think we originally just kind of flocked together, because there weren't that many women in our major, maybe? But then we ended up becoming friends and hung out a lot. Anyway, they eventually found someone else to GM a Dungeons & Dragons campaign for them. It was some guy from class I didn't know that well. Let's call him Charlie. Charlie seemed very shy, but also incredibly intelligent and studious. We didn't talk a lot. My other three friends said I would be welcome to join once I find the time. Fast forward to six months later. My Vampire the Masquerade campaign had wrapped up and I had also made another good friend from another major. Angela was really fun and excited about trying out D&D. When the others invited both of us, I also sent Charlie a private message. This was the first time we had talked beyond small talk, and I think I kind of flocked it up by leaving a bad first impression. I wanted to check to see if it was okay for him to have two new people join. I guess in my head it made sense. I wanted to make sure that he didn't agree to it just because the others wanted him to. He got defensive, saying he knew what he was doing, and that he had GM'd for a way larger group of first-timers before. I tried to explain what I meant, but when he didn't reply, I apologized for asking and that was that. First, we had some kind of mid-campaign session zero for when Angela and I joined. Angela, who was meeting everybody for the first time, hit it off super well with the rest of the group, and we were all cracking jokes and having a good time. I played a dwarven paladin who grew up in a cult. It was nice to see that everyone seemed to like my idea. The thing I remember was Charlie asking if I had any TTRPG experience. I said I had been a player in a D&D campaign before, and he went, So, you've never actually been a GM? I said something along the lines of, Not in D&D, but I have been GMing since high school, mostly Vampire the Masquerade. Somehow the mention of Vampire the Masquerade made him burst out into cackling laughter, and the rest of us kind of chuckled along. I thought that maybe he had just been nervous or surprised or something. I didn't know what was so funny, but I was sure he was laughing with me, not at me. He then said in a dramatic tone, Vampire the Masquerade, and kinda rolled his eyes. I thought it was some light teasing. I laughed, and then said something about him being cheekier than I expected him to be, which might have been the second time I flocked up because he just exchanged a glance with one of the girls after that. Bold of Charlie here as a D&D only player to mock someone for their choice of TTRPG. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Okay, I'm gonna be a little biased against this guy now. I'm sorry, but let's keep going. We started playing the actual game in the next session, but those moments where I would say something and he would burst into laughter just kept piling up and I wasn't even trying to be funny. So I started feeling more and more confused. He didn't do it with the others, but it also wasn't enough at first to justify speaking out. I mean, maybe that was just his thing. The first time I felt hurt was two sessions later, when we were investigating something in game and heading to a church. There were NPCs around, so I suggested in character that we could ask around if anybody had seen or heard something. Again, Charlie, as the GM, started to wheeze and laugh. The others then proceeded as if nothing had happened, and I got ignored in and out of character. I then just said something like, actually, that wasn't supposed to be a joke. It was an honest suggestion. I remember Charlie being annoyed when I said that for some reason. There was just kind of an awkward silence after that, and then Kate just sighed after a while, and said we probably wouldn't want to waste time and attract attention. 
So that was a pretty shitty idea. At the moment, I wasn't sure if she was saying this in or out of character, but I was super surprised by the way everyone acted, so I didn't say any more. I mean, we weren't investigating in secret, but it was still a fair point. It's fine to reject an idea, but the way everyone acted irked me a bit. This kept happening, and sometimes I would even mention that it made me uncomfortable. When I did say something, the mood would instantly get painfully awkward. Some of the things Charlie, inappropriately in my humble opinion, laughed at included when I made a mistake calculating something in battle, when I forgot I had a spell that could have been helpful in a specific situation, although I was sure I had already used that spell slot, when we were talking about homework before the session started, and I honestly mentioned feeling overwhelmed by the amount, when I cheered for the others about a good role or a good idea, or when I complimented the picture Eve drew of her character. Every time my character wanted to do something that wasn't going along with whatever another character was doing. Like when we were all standing in front of one chest, trying to unlock it, and I said my character would investigate the room more closely, or something like that. When I mentioned not feeling well, and having to leave early. Then, we gave feedback after the session. I tried one final time to convey how I felt about this. I implied that I had often been made fun of in school, and this sometimes felt the same way. Like, whatever I did was somehow ridiculous. Charlie and the four other players were trying to tell me how it was a misunderstanding. I then asked what Charlie meant. Like, why did he think it was so funny when I said really basic things? I didn't understand his explanation. He said he was just laughing, cause he felt like it. Was it a nervous laugh? No, just a laugh. Yeah, I just happen to laugh anytime you in particular decide to do something. Yeah, I can understand why the OP here feels like they're being condescended to. At first, I was willing to believe that the OP might have just been taking this all a bit too harshly. But Charlie's response is so passive aggressive. If you don't like the person that you have at your table, that you invited, you can just kick them. You're allowed to do that. But that's not it, is it? This is just my opinion, but Charlie here doesn't seem to want a resolution. In my humble opinion, I think he wants a punching bag. I don't know if the OP responded clearly or hysterically, which honestly shouldn't matter in the context of trying to resolve the situation, but if it's the latter, it sounds like Charlie was getting a kick out of this. If Charlie wanted this player in their game, and were genuinely acting in good faith to keep them in, then he would have at least heard them out, even if he ultimately felt like the OP was being ridiculous with the request. To be this dismissive, and with the way everyone else in the group just kinda goes with it, it's messed up. To the OP, assuming this is exactly how things went down, then I honestly think you're being gaslit. I'm still confused as to why your friends are still playing into this, and to understand this, I think there's some missing context. But regardless, if this is how you feel like you're being treated, then you don't need this. And judging by what happens next, it sounds like you make the right call. So without further ado, let's wrap up with this story. Eventually, I had to get home. Once I realized how drained I felt, and how I wasn't enjoying myself anymore, I decided to text Charlie. I once again sought to explain why I was struggling with the group dynamic. I also told him I had concluded that maybe it would be better if I left the group. I had a lot of other stress with schoolwork and everything, so I assured Charlie it wouldn't just be because of that. He said that all of us had a lot of work to do for school, some of us much more than me specifically, and that leaving was a pretty shitty thing to do. It would be a big letdown for everyone who put so much work into this campaign. I apologized, but I stood by my decision. I did, however, agree to play one final campaign, so we could play out my character leaving. I didn't expect everyone to be so pissed at me. I had somehow become that guy. My friends were kind of avoiding me. 
Kate asked why I had never just talked this out with Charlie, but I said that I had tried many times. As the final campaign crept closer and closer, and the others even met up for things like studying or going to the movies and stuff without telling me, I got more and more anxious about how much this was going to suck. Eventually, I cut my losses and canceled the goodbye campaign. I ended up dropping out of college for unrelated health reasons after that, although it certainly didn't help that my entire friend group made me feel like an asshole even though I tried to get along with them. I don't see them anymore. The last thing I heard was that Charlie and Angela, the woman I introduced to the friend group, had started dating. I don't know if it was because I was queer, or not as pretty as the other players, or because he felt intimidated that I already had some experience, or because I maybe actually messed up too much. But I still don't understand why everybody treated me like this, and what my ex-friends saw in this guy, who was being unnecessarily mean in my humble opinion, and refused to see things from my point of view. Based on the responses of your party, there just had to be some kind of smack talk happening behind the scenes that you weren't privy to, especially considering the party's hostility after your conversation with Charlie. But this part stuck out to me the most. You mentioned that Kate asked why you never just talked this out with Charlie, which you did, but Charlie could have also conveyed this information to Kate. That's concerning, because that tells me that Charlie told her that you didn't try to reach out, or that he just omitted that you did, either because he felt the conversation wasn't productive and didn't mention it because of that, or because he just wanted to mess with you. But unfortunately, I can only speculate, and the story is over, and some questions will just be left unanswered. Thank you for listening to today's stories. And if you like today's stories, then feel free to inspect that like button, or inquire about that subscribe button. Made it this far? Why not leave a comment? And if you can't think of a comment, then leave the comment, Laughing GM. That way I know you made it to the end of today's video. But if you want to support the channel even further, then hit that join button, or sign up on the Crow's Perch Patreon. Both links in the description of this video so that you can join the Burb aristocracy, like our Counts of Quills, like Vincent the Wardsmith, Raven, Tekris, Aaron Kados, Critical Kunik, Evix, King Drazil, Christian Pip, Cosmosis, Rikus, Jaded Gale, Haley Thompson, Zero Fang, and Netscape Navigator. Well, if you wanna, you wanna go further up in the pecking order than join up with the Barons of Beaks, I, I recognize that Barons are Lower than d counts. People say this all the time. Sh shut up. Anyway, you can be like uh, Luke Goblin, Valleyson, Jonathan Fenton, Miss Tiger Beans, New Haven RP, Kieran Slater, Running Bear 2525, Ginger Ninja, Haley McAuliffe, Brittany Mars, Raytheon of the Nerd, Sarah Warren, Spectre Spark, Ars Tarak, Ghost Legan, Mr. Hypocritical, Jesse Shodell, Kunto Sweezel, Tech Blog, Chorister, Carter Spawn, Jester King, Lord Rend, Wormy, Den of the Drake, Mickey Eatley, and Anya. But if you pledge to the Dukes of Feathers, you'll be giving me ten dollars instead of five, which is better than five. Ten is a higher number. I've looked into this. Like repetitive debug, Elf, Remus, Grunt, Kive Mind, the School Bus, Quinn, Jaritsua, Blues, Otters, Doc Salty 96, Matthew Mulqueeny, and Agroth. And with all of that out of the way, I'll see you next time. As the Crow Flies.